Je vais vous parler de la convention I am going to tell you about the climate convention, about uh, how the negotiation works were organized, and I will illustrate this with, with the negotiations on the Paris Agreement in 2015. The uh, climate convention is a, an international law treaty with 197 parties and 196 countries and the European Union. It meets once a year during what is called uh, commonly known as COP, COP, Conference of Parties. The first COP meeting took place in Berlin in 95, and the conference has been meeting every year ever since, in a different country most of the time. For years, a few COP meetings were very important, the Kyoto one in uh, 97, which adopted the Kyoto Protocol, which did not work out as well as it was initially intended to because of the uh, absence of the United States. In 2009, there was an attempt to negotiate a new international agreement in Copenhagen. There were problems again, and it largely failed. But the main lines of the agreement found then were then translated in a in decisions in Cancun one year later. And this is the decision-making system that has been governing action and is going to govern action until 2020. But it's not enough, so it was decided to negotiate a new agreement. In 2015, the COP met in Paris, and this is what I'm going to tell you about for the rest of my presentation, mostly. The uh, Conference of Parties is chaired by a president. It's usually a minister from the host country. In Paris, it was Laurent Fabius as the uh, then Foreign Affairs Ministry, and he chaired the COP21. The presidency changes every year. There are five uh, regional groups. Uh, Western Europe uh, with a few countries, uh, including uh, France, uh, Africa. In 2016, uh, Morocco uh, hosted the conference in Marrakesh. Asia Pacific this year in 2017, Fiji will be chairing the company, except that exceptionally the meeting will not take place in uh, Fiji, but in Bonn. In 2018, we'll go to Eastern Europe. Uh, Poland will be uh, chairing uh, the conference. And in 2019, a country from the the Latin American Caribbean group will uh, chair the, the uh, conference. Uh, the country has not yet been chosen, will be chosen this year. So there is a rotation. In order to find an agreement in this process, well, it is not easy. There are no voting rules. Uh, the decisions must be taken by consensus, which doesn't mean unanimously. It simply means that no state actively opposes the decision that needs to be adopted. And sometimes it is difficult to reach a consensus. And what really matters is that the process must be transparent, inclusive. If only a few countries take a decision, uh, it usually fails. And that's exactly what happened in Copenhagen. The Danes trying to negotiate in parallel a B version of the agreement. And uh, it turned out to be a failure. There was a lack of transparency, and uh, now normally the presidency of the COP is to create a consensus, and um, respecting the rules is obviously a key element. Negotiation and agreement with the 197 parties is almost impossible. It's difficult to reach an agreement with so many parties. So. The COP is organized slightly differently. Within the conference, there are subsidiary bodies. There are two subsidiary bodies that prepare most of the work, permanent subsidiary bodies uh, for implementation, the SBI, subsidiary body for implementation, and also the substar or subsidiary body for science and technological advice. These subsidiary bodies meet twice a year. There is a two-week session in uh, May and June, currently in Bonn in Germany. The, uh, where the head offices for the convention secretariat are. And at the end of the uh, COP, at the end of the year, they uh, perform follow-up of the, all the methodology. Uh, and uh, when a uh, larger negotiation is needed, like was the case in Paris, very often an ad hoc group will be set up. For Paris, the uh, the process was started in 2011 in Durban, so the group for the Durban platform actually negotiated the agreement for Paris. And 
Starting in Paris, we set up a uh, group on the Paris Agreement who will be meeting until 2018 in connection with SBI and Substa in order to negotiate implementation rules for the agreement. All the groups cover 197 parties, but there can be smaller groups with a limited number of uh, participants with experts on very specific subjects like finance, technology, adaptation, the interests of less advanced countries. So technical committees have been set up for this uh, purpose. They uh, prepare advice, proposals, uh, drafts uh, to be submitted uh, to the uh, COP. The groups meet during the year outside of the normal sessions. As I said, finding an agreement with all 196 countries is difficult, but actually the parties organize themselves in negotiation groups. There are four main groups that meet. The European Union, they are a block of 28 countries for negotiations. The European Union uh, actually has a common position carried by uh, negotiators. Not all the countries uh, take the floor. There is an upstream negotiation with a regular follow-up uh, and coordination by the member states. The other groups are not so well uh, coordinated. There is the umbrella group with uh, countries such as Australia, the United States, Japan, Russia, Norway, Iceland. But this group rarely uh, comes to a common position shared by everybody, but they still they manage to work together and they uh, share a certain degree of appreciation of the uh, work conducted. There's another small group called the, the uh, Environmental Integrity Group, Switzerland, Korea, and Mexico. Now, Swiss is among the uh, developed countries where Korea and Mexico are not treated as developed countries in the system. So it's the only, actually, it's the only group that bridges the difference between developed countries and developing countries in the convention. And finally, we have the group of 77 plus China, a group that can be found everywhere in the negotiation within the United States, the United Nations, sorry, now it's 130 countries, not 77, developed countries, chaired by South Africa in 2015 when the COP took place in Paris. And uh, South Africa actually did a very good job uh, of coordinating the group. But the group of 77 really has a common position. Very often, subgroups in this group take up positions. They have diverging interests between between China, uh, India, Brazil, Brazil, South Africa, the biggest countries, uh, the island states, the less advanced countries, the uh, African countries, the different trends uh, in Latin America, between uh, the Bolivarians uh, around Bolivia or uh, other countries. Uh, Costa Rica, for instance, uh, on the other side. And sometimes these groups have common interests, like uh, forested countries who uh, fight against uh, deforestation, the uh, Rainforest Coalition. These countries take separate positions very often. But in the end, there are 11 or 12 groups around the table, and they can uh, advocate the biggest trends. There are some countries uh, which do not take part. Turkey, for instance, that should never be forgotten in the negotiation, but at least thanks to those big groups, negotiations can be coordinated, although it is sometimes difficult for some countries to delegate the responsibilities to other to a group, including to allied uh, countries when the interests uh, are important. They want to be there during the plenary session to uh, be taken into consideration. During the COP conferences, there are also observers participating in the work, observers such as NGOs, companies, local administrations, and communities, researchers, they all play an important role in the process. They organize parallel events, they perform lobbying actions, they sometimes take the floor during plenary session when they are invited to do so, but they do not take part part in the negotiations. Negotiations are only for parties. 
and member countries. The final negotiation is sometimes difficult. It must be organized upstream. It is very important that uh, we listen to the position of every country. Some countries will submit their opinion in the written form. They submit a draft document. In Paris, the negotiation document had been drafted in February of 2015, approximately 90 pages, almost impossible to read. Very often, uh, between brackets, uh, one could find alternative options because every party wanted their own opinion to be expressed. So it was extremely difficult to structure negotiations around such a document. It is sometimes easy to organize negotiations and structure negotiations within the groups, the COPs or the subsidiary bodies. There are people who play the role of facilitators. Often a pair of countries, one developed, one developing form a pair and they will lead the negotiation for a few days and it may be sufficient to find an agreement but sometimes it takes two weeks, it's very tedious work, it takes several meetings to reach the fi final agreement and the final text and sometimes in the end everybody is so tired and exhausted that the agreement is only found because everybody is exhausted. Now in Paris what was interesting is that France being the president the negotiation work was carried out only at the end. On Saturday, 5th of December, the working group on the Durban platform ADP submitted uh, the final draft, the final draft for decisions and agreement, but the document had not yet been finalized. There were many options in the document, and it was absolutely essential for us to, to organize the work. On the other hand, we needed to comply with the legit legitimacy of the negotiation process. We could not do what the Danes had done in Copenhagen, so preparing a B version of the document. There is no B plan in an agreement document or text. The text must be based on the work conducted by all the parties throughout the year. And this is exactly what we did. Throughout the 2015 year, in collaboration with the uh, Peruvian presidency of uh, COP20, which was the one before the COP21 in Paris, meetings, informal meetings were organized in order to prepare the political process uh, to analyze the main topics financing, long-term objectives, transparency systems. The informal meetings took place in Paris with the negotiators to begin with and then with the ministers, simply so that people learned about the topics, so that ambiguities could be removed, because sometimes the same word is used by several parties, except it means something different. So sometimes the concepts had to be very defined very precisely so that an agreement could be found. And so that everybody felt like they knew where the landing places were. Okay, they had not yet agreed, but they knew the agreement would be located somewhere near the landing place. And at least if everybody understands what we're aiming for, it's easier to reach the final agreement and land in the right landing place. The informal process therefore helped us prepare for the final moment at the, in the middle of the COP21 when finally negotiations regarding the agreement itself were resumed. There was still a lot to do, and Laurent Fabius, who was uh, chairing the conference, met with all the parties uh, several times, he had to listen, and this was absolutely essential, being the president of the chairman of the COP, he had to listen to the people, to meet the groups, and leave the door open for everyone, because if one party among the 197 is left out, it may veto the final decision and say no. So if we want everybody on board, we have to meet with everybody, a lot of diplomacy, was done upstream in order to understand what everybody expected, what everybody wanted, so that they would share the agreement at the end of the conference. We had a team of experts who followed the various countries' positions. They performed a very detailed analysis to have all the necessary elements. And then ministers from the various countries were also involved. They had helped us during the informal meetings. And during the very last days of the conference, they facilitated work on several subjects such as financing or the type of action uh, requested from the countries, uh, 
Uh, also, uh, loss and damage, uh, transparency, long-term objectives for the agreement. All these subjects required a lot of work to find a consensus. There were several iterations of the document during the very last days, but the iteration regarded the text by the parties with the ideas coming from the parties. And every time we listened to the parties' feedback and reactions so that during the very last day, we had the final proposal for a compromise. We hoped that this would be the final draft. Unfortunately, there were still a few mistakes, and we had to correct those mistakes for the final adoption of the draft. But at least the parties trusted us, because during throughout the process, because we were transparent, inclusive, we were open-minded, we listened, then there was a lot of trust. And at the end, we were able to say, this is the agreement. And we got the agreement adopted with a consensus. And that is precisely what Laurent Fabius did on the very last day when he banged down his gavel on Saturday, 12th of December, when the Paris Agreement was adopted. It was, a, it was very strong, it was highlight. It was a lot of emotion in the uh, conference room, but it was very important that we got there. It, although the process was time consuming, very long, a lot of effort went into the process, many people contributed, but it was important that we found this consensus. Also, it was difficult to come to a consensus. Now we have an agreement which we believe is a universal agreement, positive, ambitious agreement, we already changed the paradigm a few years ago. We were no longer talking about sharing the burden and the fault, but rather going towards a development. It's a sort of bottom-up process, as we say. Everyone should say, this is what I want to do, this is what I'm going to do, trying to break down the carbon budget country per country, because we found that that was impossible to do. The Paris Agreement has five main areas. There are approximately 20 articles, 10 pages. But I would like to highlight five, the five main areas. We found during the process that this agreement actually sets the course. We must keep the temperature rise clearly below 2 degrees, possibly even 1.5. But for this, we need to reach an emission peak very soon, and then following this, there should be a decrease in the emission. We need to find a balance between absorption and emissions, carbon neutral, a carbon neutral situation. And obviously, we have to be resilient and cap capable of adjusting. We must be compatible with the objective. Setting the course is essential, because that is what states what our ambitions are. And next, everybody should decide what they want to do on the national level. It is nationally determined, as we say in English. Now, when the countries came to Paris, what was interesting and important was that 190 parties had already announced what they were going to do. They came with a national contribution, which covered more than 95% of the world emissions. So we knew that the agreement was already universal before even we had negotiated before we had negotiated it but the objectives are not sufficient we're not on the path to two degrees maybe three degrees but we're not on the path to two degrees although this is a starting point the agreement is a dynamic agreement and uh, it will rise the ambition in raise the ambition in time every five year we years we review the situation we take collective stock of the situation regarding the uh, objectives this is what we call the global review the first one will take place in 2023 but in 2018 we will perform what we call the facilitation dialogue in preparation for the first review preparing for the first objective review and in 20 20, the parties will submit again or renew, revise their contribution, obviously f for the purpose of progressing, of increasing the effort so that we can stay on course for two degrees. And then in 2025, again, there will be another review, and we need to keep the pace towards progression. Two essential elements, collaboration with the instruments inside the agreement, what we call the implementation tools, finance, technology, and also capacity reinforcement, creation of institutions in the countries. And also we have collaboration outside of the agreement. Now, this was the innovation in Paris. 
We thought that this was the action agenda to get not only states involved, but also non-governmental bodies, communities, companies. It's all very well to say we want an agreement, but they also have to act themselves. So they decided to take action. There are partnerships between governments and private actors regarding energy, access to energy, renewable energies, building forestry, agriculture, water, ocean, etc. Bearing in mind that this is an agreement between states, the Paris Agreement, but we have a polycentric action to which many different players are contributing. The fight against climate change cannot be performed only by the states. The private actors also must participate.